Howdy! Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. Have you ever wondered what is an MS attack, a flare, an exacerbation, a relapse? It's actually all the same thing. By the end of this video, you'll understand what an attack is, how to identify it, how it typically presents, and very importantly, what we can do to treat it. Now don't turn away, because all of that starts right now. Let's start with the highfalutin medical definition of an MS attack. This would be a new neurological deficit or an old one that's been gone for a long time and come back, lasting for at least 24 hours in the absence of a fever, preceded by 30 days of clinical stability with findings on examination to support its presence. <laughs> that's a lot of words. In plain English, an MS attack is when you accrue a new neurological dysfunction, something stops working, and it lasts for longer than a day or two, and you gotta come clean that something ain't right. So what's happening during an MS attack pathologically? Your naughty autoreactive immune system, which lives in the bloodstream, crosses the blood-brain barrier, gaining access to the central compartment, brain and spinal cord. It sees a part of your nervous system as a foreign invader and attacks it using inflammation, causing it to short circuit. This interrupts the electrical signaling in the brain and spinal cord and creates a new neurological problem, a loss of function. And where that attack occurs determines what kind of loss you have. There are many different classic presentations for attack. Let's discuss them now. A very common presentation of MS attack is optic neuritis, when the naughty autoreactive immune system attacks the nerve that runs your eye, the optic nerve. This causes it to swell decreasing your ability to see out of that eye and causing pain when you look left to right. Another common presentation is transverse myelitis, when there's inflammation and swelling in the spinal cord. This can present as a change in sensation of part of your body or your limb, whether that be a new numbness and tingling or literally sensations of pain. It could present as incoordination and clumsiness of a hand or a leg. It could present as weakness of a limb, where your arm is heavy and you're dropping items or literally dragging your leg. It can also present as difficulties with the down there's, new difficulties with bowel, bladder, or bedroom. A third common presentation of MS attack is what we call a brainstem syndrome, where your naughty autoreactive immune system attacks the base of the brain. This can affect the cranial nerves that run your face and manifests as things like double vision or a droopy side of your face or searing pain in part of your face or difficulty with speaking or swallowing. Now, those are not the only MS attacks that are possible, they're just the most common. Key takeaway, if you have a new neurological problem that lasts longer than a day, that merits a phone call to your neurologist. You may be having an MS attack and will need to be worked up. One, to make sure that you don't have an infection, and two, to be examined properly. Don't wait, Call the neurologist and be evaluated, because as you'll learn in upcoming sections of this video, there are things we can do to hasten your recovery and protect your nervous system. The first thing we'll do when we're concerned there might be an attack is to rule out what we call a pseudo-attack. Pseudo is Greek for similar to, but it ain't. A pseudo-attack is a very real neurological event. You really are having new deficits or old deficits that have come back. They're just not caused by new bouts of inflammation. Most commonly, they're caused by things like a fever from an infection, which raises your core body temperature and causes old areas of damage to short circuit. Now, as a human being, you don't come with a rule book and you don't know that's what's going on. You may not even know that you have a sinus infection or a urinary tract infection. But when we hear about new neurological symptoms, we're gonna test you for infections. And if we find one and identify a pseudo attack, we use things like antibiotics to hasten your recovery. Key takeaway. You need to be evaluated by the neurologist when there's concern for attack. Don't just assume that it's an attack and call the neurologist and hope that they'll call in high dose steroids. That's a recipe for a problem. For example, if you have an infection causing a pseudo attack and we give you high dose steroids, we might make that infection worse. I'll share a brief story of a patient of mine that called me saying, hey look doc, my left leg is numb. I know this is an MS attack. I really don't wanna come in. Can you just call in steroids? Now, fortunately, I was insistent, and they came in. And she absolutely did have a numb leg, but it was also red and swollen. We did a medical workup, and it turned out that she had a blood clot in her leg. 
She also had blood clots in her chest. She was suffering from a DVT and a PE. And obviously, we needed to treat that. This was not an attack. And if we had not caught that, she could have had very serious medical problems. So if you have new neurological deficits lasting longer than a day, and you don't have an infection driving it, we're now concerned that you're having a bona fide MS attack, and we need to discuss treatment. Now, historically, old school neurologists sometimes treated and sometimes didn't. Unfortunately, that old style is kind of falling out of favor. They used to say, well, we only treat very serious attacks, for example, when someone's weak. And if you're just numb and tingly, well, let's not worry about it. And I don't agree with that. When you're having new neurological deficits, that represents new inflammatory damage in your brain and spinal cord, and I don't want that for you. And so I think it's critical that we no longer think with that old style of thinking, and we address an attack for what it is, and we serve up therapy. Now, I've had patients tell me, well, doc, I don't want to tell you if I have an attack because I don't want you to make me take steroids. I don't make people do things. I need you to tell me if you're having new symptoms so we can figure out if you're having an attack. It's actually one of the key ways that we can assess how well we're controlling your disease. At the end of the day, if you choose not to be treated, you're an adult and that's your decision. But I think it merits a conversation before that's where we land. So how do we treat an attack? The mainstay of treatment is high dose corticosteroids. Now corticosteroids are not what bodybuilders take to get big muscles. Those are anabolic steroids. Corticosteroids help quell inflammation and we have to use super high doses to penetrate the central compartment. The most traditional way of doing that is through an IV giving you a medicine called solumedrol. And we typically administer one gram of solumedrol through the vein that typically takes about 45 minutes and we'll do it for several days in a row, typically between three and five days. Now, sometimes when you take steroids, particularly early on in your disease course, you can have a massive recovery and get better really quickly, sometimes even during the treatment. That's not always the case. And I like to remind patients that steroids change the DNA and therefore the behavior of white blood cells, making them less pro-inflammatory. We can see benefits for the duration of the white blood cell. And so sometimes we'll give steroids and then we'll see a benefit at a delay, even a delay of many weeks. Steroids will sometimes cause a complete resolution of the symptoms, but not always. Sometimes you only get partially better after an attack. Now, IV solumedrol is not the only way that we can give someone high-dose corticosteroids. Sometimes someone doesn't have access to an infusion center, or they literally can't tolerate IV infusions. And in these cases, we oftentimes will use high-dose oral steroids, and I mean really high-dose. Now, the average general practitioner, your primary care doctor, might prescribe oral prednisone, somewhere between 20 and maybe 60 milligrams, when trying to treat something like asthma. In order to treat an MS attack, we have to use doses over 1,000 milligrams. Oftentimes, we'll give 25 tablets of 50 milligram prednisone pills. 25 times 50 is 1,250 milligrams, which is a lot. That's the bioequivalent of that gram of solumedrol. Now, fortunately, this has been very well studied, and there's a Cochrane Review article which proves that high-dose oral steroids, the way I'm suggesting, are as safe, as effective, and as well-tolerated as IV steroids. As a matter of course, whenever I call in high-dose oral steroids to a pharmacy, I like to call the pharmacist to make sure that they understand that I really did intend to do that and that it really is a safe maneuver. Now, high-dose steroids is not without risk, and so it's important to always keep those top of mind. Steroids can make managing sugar much more challenging. And so if someone has diabetes or even a history of gestational diabetes, we have to factor that into our decision making. For diabetics, we oftentimes need to put them on a sliding scale insulin to keep them safe during steroids. Steroids can also increase the risk of a stomach ulcer or a peptic ulcer, which can be life-threatening. And so if someone has a history of peptic ulcers, we have to consider that. Oftentimes we will put them on twice daily PPIs to protect their stomach, and we need to work closely with their primary care doctor to keep them safe during the treatment. Likewise, steroids can rarely cause psychosis, where you can see and hear things that aren't there, or you could have delusional thoughts and things like that. And so if someone has a history of psychosis, we may need to work carefully with their primary care or with their psychiatrist to safely navigate through high-dose steroid treatment. There are other less threatening side effects from steroids, things like causing temporary weight gain from retaining water, which you'll pee off later, 
making you super hungry and yet food tastes horrible, making you super irritable or making it hard to sleep at night. These things are all temporary, but they're very unpleasant. And that's why I oftentimes refer to steroids as a necessary evil. I find them necessary to hasten the recovery from the attack, but the side effects are pretty darn evil. Now, as I hinted at earlier, steroids don't always work. Sometimes, particularly early in the disease course, we give steroids and wow, people get better quickly, but that's not always the case. And sometimes you'll give someone steroids and they barely make a recovery. And we call this a treatment failure, if you will. And when that happens, we don't wanna just sit on our hands and say, uh, oh, that's too bad. We have several options to consider. The first is a second course of steroids because that's been shown through science to help. Another option is to initiate something called total plasma exchange or plasmapheresis. Now total plasma exchange is not a drug, it's actually a therapy. We have to put in large bore IVs, typically in the chest or in the neck, and we hook you up to a machine which filters your blood and takes out the autoantibodies, putting your blood back in. That's called an exchange. To be successful, we oftentimes have to do one exchange done every other day for a total of five to seven exchanges. And oftentimes this has to be done in a hospital setting for safety reasons. We don't just sign up for total plasma exchange airy-fairy, and we typically reserve that for severe medically refractory attacks. Not everyone has access to plasmapheresis or plasma exchange. And if we have a medically refractory attack that doesn't respond to one or two courses of steroids and you can't get plasma exchange, we could consider an off-label therapy called intravenous immunoglobulin or IVIG. This is when you pull thousands of donors' antibodies from blood donation. They're put together and they're cleaned, and then they're infused in the vein. And those antibodies float around your body, binding up your autoantibodies and pulling them out of solution. This can be an effective way of treating a medically refractory attack. I would submit when someone has an attack that doesn't respond to steroids, plasma exchange or phoresis oftentimes results in about 50% of those people making a meaningful recovery. It's important, obviously, to point out that both plasma exchange and IVIG have a host of side effects, and they can be very expensive therapies. But if you're not recovering from an attack, particularly a severe attack, it's critical that we consider whether or not we need to pull the trigger on those second-line therapies. Another option for an attack that doesn't respond to steroids is an old-school drug called ACTH. Now, ACTH is actually a hormone made in the body. And when your own body releases ACTH, it causes your adrenal glands to make their own steroids. Now, ACTH, which is branded as either Acthar or corticotropin hormone, is actually harvested from pigs. And it's cleaned, and you inject it under your skin. It's typically given as an under-the-skin injection for five to 10 days in a row, making you make your own steroids. Now this can be very helpful for particularly for people that don't tolerate steroids. So if someone has brittle diabetes or they've had psychosis in the past or for other reasons they haven't tolerated steroids, this might be a very viable option to help them recover from an MS attack. Rarely, someone with MS suffers a severe attack where they've given one or two courses of steroids and they haven't responded and they've had second line therapy like phoresis and they haven't responded and they're not doing very well. Almost always these patients are hospitalized at this point. And sometimes in these rare situations, we need to use third level therapy or tertiary level therapy. These would include chemotherapeutic agents like giving intravenous cyclophosphamide or intravenous rituximab. Key takeaway, don't wait. If you've received steroids for an attack and you're not getting better, make sure that you present to your neurologist so that we can consider the prompt initiation of second or even third line therapy to hasten your recovery and get you back in the game. Now, if you've suffered an MS attack and yet you've been properly taking an MS disease modifying therapy, we call that a breakthrough attack, meaning the attack broke through the DMT. In the modern era with highly effective DMTs, there's an expectation to have no attacks. And so if you have an attack, a month after that attack has been treated, we need to get back together in clinic and discuss whether or not that's an okay DMT to stay on. Think of the disease modifying therapy as a birth control pill against future attacks. If you were on birth control and you got knocked up, then it didn't work and we wouldn't wanna stay on that birth control. And likewise, if you were properly taking a disease modifying therapy and then you had an MS attack, then we need to have a frank conversation about if we need to change DMT. It doesn't mean that we're always gonna change DMT after an attack, but it does mean that we need to double back and have that difficult conversation. Key takeaway. 
A month to six weeks after an attack, you need to be seen in the clinic by your MS provider. We need to make sure that you've made a meaningful recovery and that we don't need to use a second line therapy to continue to treat the attack. And we need to have a discussion about whether we need to change your disease modifying therapy. In conclusion, MS attacks are complex, but being able to identify what an attack is, how it typically presents, how we identify it and how we treat it helps empower you to take control of your own health. And I have a question for you. When was the last time that you suffered an attack? What were you given for treatment and how did you recover? Please leave your answer in the comment section below. As always, my name is Aaron Boster and thank you for learning about MS with me. If you found this video to be helpful, do me a favor and give it a thumbs up. And if you'd like to up your game and learn more about how to beat up on MS, click the video that's on your screen right now. Until my next Monday morning video or my next live stream, or even better yet, the next time I see you at the Boster Center for MS, this is Aaron Boster saying be safe and take care.